maybe have seven minutes at the end to talk about some of these practice problems. I think it'd be helpful to you guys. We'll just keep going. All right. Whew. Okay. So now we're going to talk about sympathetic agonists. So groups that act like epinephrine and norepinephrine. All right. So first we're going to talk about alpha-1 agonists. All right. Alpha-1 agonists, what do they do? They stop a runny nose. They dilate your pupils. They increase your blood pressure. Uh, they make it harder to urinate. And they uh, constipate you, amongst other things. So that's it. You're, those are the things that they do. The side effects are all of those things I just mentioned. And the contraindications are situations where you wouldn't want to do those things. So if you dilate somebody's, if you dilate the pupil, it actually blocks the outflow of the eye, which can increase eye pressure. So you don't want to ever dilate the pupil in a patient who has a tendency towards something called narrow angle glaucoma. So when you start watching uh, drug ads and start paying attention to it more, at the end, sometimes they'll say, ask your doctor if you have glaucoma, prostate enlargement, or are taking an MAOI. And that almost always is referring to drugs that are in some way an alpha agonist or a anticholinergic drug. Um, because the dilated people can make glaucoma worse. Um, an MAOI, I sort of briefly alluded to this before, but monoamine oxidase is one of the enzymes that breaks down epinephrine and norepinephrine. And I have it just here inside, but there's some outside too. There's chemical open transferase and monoamine oxidase. So you may have heard of an MAOI because it's in a lot of drug ads. And what that's doing is blocking the enzyme that breaks down norepinephrine. So there's the, the enzymes that break down these ligands. MAOI, I'm sorry, monoamine oxidase, MAO, breaks down norepinephrine. And in about two pages, we'll see that acetylcholinesterase bond breaks down acetylcholine. So that's a, the MAOIs are indirect acting adrenergic agonists because they block the enzyme that breaks down the norepinephrine, and that means the level of norepinephrine increases. Okay. Uh, other things you would not want to give an alpha 1 agonist somebody has high blood pressure because an alpha 1 agonist will just make that worse. And usually, if they have heart problems, you want to avoid it because heart, people with heart problems tend to have high blood pressure, so you want to avoid that as well. <clears throat> so, if you can just remember that phenylephrine and pseudephedrine are both alpha-1 agonists, you already know basically things you could use the drug for and the contraindications, because you can kind of work it out. What else do you notice about the drugs pseudephedrine and phenylephrine? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they both end with RIN, and they both sort of have an F sound in the pH sound, right? So if you can kind of remember that RIN and an F sound tends to be an alpha-1 agonist, you're in good shape for the test. There are a few weird outlier drugs that have those same sounds, but you'll notice, uh, I think I give one on this table, ephedrine. I don't have it bold-faced, because I want you to learn this and not be distracted by that. So I intentionally pick um, representative drugs that are commonly prescribed in America and are easy to remember because of their endings. Okay? All right. Now, there's uh, one other thing I have to mention about alpha-1 agonists in terms of practical use, which is also kind of cool. So phenylephrine or pseudephedrine, either one, if you give it IV, it's work, usually it's because you want to increase blood pressure, and it increases blood pressure through alpha-1 receptors on Be like typing things so you can just type in anonymous answers. So how does alpha one, how does an alpha one agonist increase blood pressure? Yes, it constricts the non-essential blood vessel, right? So if you give it as an injection, you know whenever you have an injection, the concentration in the injection is going to be way higher than the concentration in your whole bloodstream. So when you're first injecting something like norepinephrine into the IV, what happens if you miss the vein? and accidentally injected into the tissues. What's going to happen to those tissues that you accidentally injected that drug? What's going to happen to the blood vessels in them? They're going to constrict. And in fact, they'll constrict so tightly that the tissue will die. What's called necrosis, the tissue dies. So that's not an uncommon thing that happens in hospitals, is the, I, the IV line, it's what's called, the, the term is extravasates or infiltrates. 
Um, usually in healthcare, between other professionals, we say, we blew a vein. You don't want to say that to a patient, but you say, I blew a vein. Um, and that just means the drug didn't go in the vein, but it's around it. All right, so then the tissue has no oxygen and it dies. So what do you think you use to fix that problem? Or do you just run away? You just run out of the hospital, change your identity, move to Brazil. Brazil's a nice place, but yeah. An alkaline blocker. Uh -huh. right? Agonist and antagonist are always going to sort of be the thing to fix the other. Unfortunately, not every drug has an antagonist, um, but the ones that do, you can you can fix that. So the the thing you accidentally infiltrate with the norepinephrine, you see the tissue just turn white because there's no blood, and like white, like this color. I don't care what your original color of skin was, be like this. It's terrifying to see. Um, then you can just then take some alpha-1 blocker and inject it into the tissue and then to get that blood flow back. So see, you already learned one way to uh, fix one of, uh, fix a mistake, keep you out of court. Now, that same, those, the alpha-1 agonist is also used um, topically, so either as eye drops like Visine or Clear Eyes um, or as a nasal spray for a runny nose. So why is it that the that Visine makes your pupils I'm sorry, why is it that Visine makes your eyes look white, gets rid of that redness of the eye? It's because it's constricting the blood vessels on your conjunctiva, right? So what happens to the tissue on your eye? It doesn't turn black and die because many of you have many times used um, Visine to uh, make your eyes look white. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. So why doesn't the tissue, you know, die and fall off like the zombie? Well, it's because your eyes are open to the air. You actually absorb some oxygen through the environment on your kind of time. That's how your cornea stays alive, too. That's, your cornea is all cells, uh, but they get the oxygen through the atmosphere. All right? And same thing with sinuses. You spray to make your nose stop running, but the reason the inside of your sinuses don't die is because there's oxygen in the air. So that works out. The problem is, is that those tissues are getting some oxygen from the air, but not as much as they'd like. So whenever you have reduced blood flow to any tissue, the tissue then sends out uh, what are called growth factors, little signals, like we don't have enough blood vessels, um, and new blood vessels grow. So it had, I've seen many patients who come in, they say, my eyes always look red, all my coworkers think I'm drunk, um, and I use Visine every day, and it no longer makes them white. And it's because now, when you look at their tissue under a microscope, it's all blood vessels. It's just a mat of blood vessels. Um, and so that's not good. So uh, you don't want to use a topical alpha-1 agonist more than a couple of days in a row. Perfectly fine if you're having pictures taken or something, but, you know. Usually the people who came in with this problem were stoners because they would um, smoke marijuana and then they would put visine in their eyes. <laughs> and after a while, they just always had red eyes. So not a good thing. Beta-1 agonist, heart and kidneys. Heart increases heart rate. You use it to increase heart rate. You don't use it when the heart rate is too already too fast because that'll make it worse. So increasing heart rate increases blood pressure, which is something you'd want to use when a patient's in shock. So hopefully it makes sense. Yeah. Beta 2 agonist, we already talked about it. You can use that to make it easier to breathe. Um, you could use it to stop uh, uh, uterine contractions in preterm uh, labor. But again, there's other drugs that people use more often now. All right, and one of the side effects is tachycardia because of that reflex tachycardia. Uh, the non-specific beta-1 and beta-2 agonists, the first drugs that come out of these other various classes are usually the least specific. Newer drugs are always better, or are supposed to be better than the old ones, because there's no market for a drug that isn't, doesn't work as good as something that's already around. So, um, the older drugs like isoproteranol as an agonist or propranolol as a blocker, um, they've been around a long time, they're not as good. And you might say, well, then why does anyone use them? Like, why would you use a crappier drug if there's other drugs that are available? And the reason is, because those drugs have been around for 50 years, there's good scientific evidence as to what they work for and what they don't work for. Whereas a drug that only came out two years ago may only have three or four years of evidence behind it. Um, and so uh, you're going to see that these old-timey, non-specific drugs with tons of side effects, you'll see patients on them all the time. Um, Norepinephrine is specifically alpha-1 and beta-1, which is, and using norepinephrine as a drug, as an IV drug, uh, is usually reserved for 
really like a patient who's almost dead from shock. Um, when my dad had his brain abscess, one of the I was bugging the uh, I've seen nurses about what drug they were using, and uh, she said I asked her about IV norepinephrine. She said, "Oh yeah, the mnemonic for that is Levofed, soon be dead." <laughs> so like, don't ever say that to a patient's family. <laughs> but it, it didn't. I mean, it was okay for me. But uh, the idea was is that if you have to give somebody IV norepinephrine to support their blood pressure because increasing vasoconstriction through alpha one, increasing heart rate through beta one, then that patient is really in trouble because you've already tried like all the other drugs. Um, but you know what it does. And then epinephrine you can also use as a drug, obviously. And it works great because it works like the adrenaline in your body. So it uh, does all the terrific things that the sympathetic nervous system does, uh, which is really great when you're in shock or if your heart's screwed up or if you're having an anaphylactic allergic attack. All right, now for the test again, just the bold case drugs are the only ones I expect you to be able to recognize and tell me what class of drug it is. If I were to ask you a question about tetrahydrazoline or, or one of these other drugs, or some metarol, I would say tetrahydrazoline drops, also called biazine, are alpha-1 agonists used topically. I would tell you, you know, the drug class. So just the bold case one. And the reason I might give you more than one is because I want you to notice that the endings are the same. So albuterol, metoproteranol, isoproteranol, if it ends with OL, it's some kind of beta thing. So if, it's, if, it's, if it ends with OL, it's a beta one, it's usually a beta two agonist. If it's a blocker, it's usually a beta one blocker. Of course, if it's a blocker, it doesn't end with OL, it ends with So if it ends with OL, it's a, usually a beta agonist. If it ends with OLOL, it's usually a beta-1 blocker, unless it's propranolol. Okay. Uh, now, again, now we're going to do the opposite. It's just the opposite. So an alpha-1 blocker does all the opposite things that the alpha-1 agonists do, all right? Except they also can screw up sexual function. But other than that, all right? So alpha-1 blockers lower blood pressure. Alpha-1 blockers make it easier to urinate. So somebody with BPH, benign prostate hypertrophy, which is a problem that plagues men as they get older, uh, where the prostate gets large enough that it presses on the urethra, so it makes it very difficult to urinate. It takes forever to urinate. Um, so uh, you can use these drugs, prazosin, terazosin, doxazosin, alphazosin. What's the same about all these drugs? Zosin. And actually, although prazosin or uh, mini-press is usually used for blood pressure, and terazosin or hytrin is usually used for a big prostate, you could use either for either. If it's a zombie apocalypse and you only have one, it's fine. You could use either one for either. All right, so you don't really have to remember the different zosins. You just have to, the different drugs for me, you just have to remember the ending. And I'm never gonna ask you a question like, which drug is the one you use? I mean, I'll ask you that maybe in an extra credit question or something, but within the context of the, context of the exam, I'll give you the options. You, at this point in your career, you only need to be able to recognize the drug class. You need to be able you know, to recognize a drug to, to know what drug class it's in. So Zosin, right? And again, the side effects are all the opposite. So drooling, uh, tearing, pooping, uh, incontinence of uh, urine or feces, uh, low heart rate, low blood pressure, those are all the side effects of those drugs. The beta-1 blockers very commonly used for class of drugs. Um, and they mostly work by reducing heart rate and reducing blood pressure through that renin angiotensin aldosterone thing. Tons of different uh, uses. Um, and notice that the beta-1 blockers can be used for glaucoma. The alpha-1 agonists you don't use with glaucoma. So again, it's sort of an opposite thing. Uh, but they, propranol has tons of indications and tons of side effects and tons of contraindications. We're gonna learn them like one per test. So for this test, I want you to know that propranolol, because it not only blocks beta-1 receptors, but also beta-2, you do not give it to people with breathing problems. So if somebody has emphysema or asthma or they have horrible pneumonia and their, their lungs are like packed with pus and stuff, then you don't want to give propranolol to those patients because it'll make it harder to breathe. Does that make sense? And then lastly, we have the weird beta blocker drugs. These are drugs that were sort of originally classified as beta blockers and then turned out they were alpha blockers also. But by then everybody had been calling them beta blockers. So I think of them as weird beta blockers because they're not actually, they actually block everything. Um, and the way that I remember that they're weird is 
The normal beta blockers end with all lol, and the weird ones end with something else lol, like I lol, carvidal lol. I lol at you because I'm weird, right? So carvidal lol, uh, that's easy to remember that that's the weird one. So all lol, I don't know of any drugs that end with all lol that aren't a beta blocker. All right, I already talked about sympathetic, I already talked about indirect versus direct, right? So all the drugs we just talked about are direct acting because they bind alpha and beta receptors. Then there's the indirect acting ones. So I have a bunch of indirect acting drugs here listed in bold face. What I want you to know for the test, you will have to eventually know the mechanism for this, for me, for this test. All you need to know is be able to recognize which of these drugs is which class, all right? So a sympathetic agonist drug is amphetamine, like speed, right, or Adderall or Ritalin, that kind of a drug. Cocaine, an MAOI, again, it blocks that enzyme. And tyramine is something that's found in food that can mimic sympathetic uh, actions. Um, so for this, at, at this point in the class, uh, I just want you to know that if I give you tyramine, MAOI, cocaine, or amphetamine, that you know that that'll act like a sympathetic drug through indirect action. Right? So sympathetic drugs like phenylephrine and Sudafed, those drugs tend to keep you awake, which should make sense if you know, if, if ever heard of, of uh, amphetamines or cocaine, which tend to make people more awake because they, they mimic that sympathetic action. And in terms of indirect blockers, again, I have some mechanisms here drawn out for you, like the way that these drugs block the action of norepinephrine. All I want you to know is that they are indirect acting drugs and they reduce the levels of norepinephrine because they're indirect. So alpha methyl dopa and reserpine. There's other ones, bertillium, other ones. All right, so we're just going to start there because, again, if you know that the, if you have two different drugs that act by two different mechanisms, then if you put them both into patients at the same time, you're going to get an additive or sometimes even a synergistic effect with it more effect. If you have two drugs that have the same exact mechanism, there's no point in adding two of them just add more of the first one. Right? If you have phenylephrine and pseudofedrin, there's no point in taking both. Just take a higher dose of one of them. It's, there's no, they're the same mechanism, they bind the same receptor, there's no added activity. All right. <clears throat> okay, that's sympathetic side. All right, so again, if you know where the, which organs the receptors are in, and you can remember that, and, and this part is just straight memorization. I, there, I don't know an easy way to do it. It's just, you just have to learn the drug names and what class they go into. But fortunately, you can cut down the amount of memorization by things like the trick like Zosin or Allol or All or Frin. That kind of thing helps in terms of having to, you, it means that you have to memorize less drugs. Does that make sense? Does it seem less terrifying now? Slide, no, still terrifying? Okay. Well, hopefully less overwhelming. All right, now the parasympathetic side is just the opposite of the sympathetic side and has the same effects pretty much as the antagonist. So if you have an overdose of acetylcholine in your body or you have an overdose of an acetylcholine agonist, what are your symptoms? It's all the opposite of the fight or flight, right? Now there's a there's a um, acronym that a lot of students really like called sludge, uh, which is salivation, drooling, lacrimation, crying, urination, and crying like, not because they, they might not be crying like I'm sad, I've cried, just like tears coming up. Uh, urination, pooping, stomach cramps, GI abscess, and emesis, which means vomiting. Um, I don't really like to remember it as an acronym because it, that doesn't include the things that kill you, like your heart rate gets super low, your blood pressure gets really low, all your bronchi, constricts so you can't breathe. Those seem to me to be more relevant in terms of keeping the patient alive when people get small. Um, so I like to think of sludge as just the patient is sitting in sludge because if they have a cholinergic overdose of any kind, everything comes out of them. They're vomiting and crying and drooling and pooping and urinating. It's a horrible, disgusting, sludgy mess, right? Uh, there's on my uh, website, there's a uh, link to um, one of the, uh, a video from the 60s of the uh, U.S. Army giving some of the uh, soldiers just a little touch of nerve gas, just a little bit. Um, and nerve gas is, is a irreversibly acting, indirect acting, uh, cholinergic 
poison. And because of that, let's see, introductory outer nervous system. Uh, because of that, the symptoms of poisoning are pretty horrific. Um, so there's that link there. I don't want to show it in class. There's a, it's quite upsetting to watch. Uh, but um, they basically just expose these soldiers to um, cholinergic overdose. And so you see them staggering around because their blood pressure drops and they're vomiting. And it's pretty awful. And they do it to a goat. It's horrible. It's the, one hopes that the army still isn't doing that kind of stuff to its soldiers, but you know, who knows? Who knows? All right. So again, you, you kind of already know now what all of these drugs are going to do because all of the muscarinic drugs are going to bind the muscarinic receptors on all the autonomic nerves. And so you're going to have the opposite effect. All right. So here's again the picture a picture of the. Uh, site of uh, action here of the acetylcholine being made in the presynaptic nerve. It's released, it binds its receptor. When it binds its receptor, it floats away, and it floats away and is eventually chewed up by something called a cholinesterase. Acetylcholinesterase that breaks down acetylcholine into acetate and choline. All right? So now this is a totally different ligand. It's a totally different molecule. This is acetylcholine, not epinephrine nor epinephrine. Okay? How are you guys? You guys are champions. If you need to take a break, please go. Take a break, take a break. All right? All right. Now, the thing that gets students confused about this is just this, I think, the difference between the two receptors. So just got to keep that in mind that there's two different types of receptors. Now, notice, for the direct-acting cholinergics, I've only given you one drug to learn. All right? Because actually, acetylcholine, you can't really use on a practical basis. You can't inject it into patients because there's cholinesterase in the bloodstream and uh, it just, you, you inject it here and it's already all gone by the time it gets to like here. It's gone. You can give it topically. Um, but I've given you one drug here, bethanacol. All right? Now, bethanacol is marketed under urocholine. So it's a, ur, ur, that sort of tells you something to do with urine. If it's cholinergic, does it make it easier or more difficult to breathe, to uh, pee? Excuse me. Is the, is the urine going to flow freely? Or will it dribble out a little bit at a time? Cholinergic. Freely, right? Because everything comes out of you with cholinergic. All right? So you can use this to increase urine flow in a patient who has had surgery and uh, usually after anesthesia, people stop their name. Could you use this drug for a patient with big prostate? No. No. Why not? Okay. same way as a alpha-1 blocker, right? Because both of them, the target organ is the bladder. An alpha-1 blocker makes it easier to pee. A cholinergic agonist makes it easier to pee. You do it. The only problem with, again, using a cholinergic is you end up having lots of side effects. Now, here's a critical thinking question, okay? So this is completely, all right? So I've been trying to, to, to drill home this idea that you don't have to memorize different receptors for muscarinics, but it's been noticed that bifanacol, when you use it to make someone pee, it tends to not make your heart rate get slow. So what was, what can you deduce from that? It definitely binds acetylcholine receptors. It definitely has most of the muscarinic effects, but it doesn't change the heart rate too much. Why would it not affect the heart? This is a drug, not the natural way. Not because of the system. Really. The reason is because the thanacol somehow doesn't bind that receptor. So this is how we find out that there are subtypes of receptors. Is because someone develops a drug and then it doesn't have all the effects of the ligands. Then you know, oh wait, that must mean there's a slightly different receptor in the heart. And in fact, now that's been classified as an M2 receptor. So you could say, well, the thanacol is like definitely an M3 specific drug, but nobody uses it for that. And that's why you don't have to worry about it. But that, that's the idea. It's the way we find out that there's different subtypes of receptors is by developing drugs that we hope are agonists or antagonists to the ligand, and it turns out that they don't find all of the receptors we were expecting. And that's how we get the clue that there's subtypes. The same thing happened with 
acetylcholine. People weren't doing experiments in labs. Let's use some muscarin. Let's use some nicotine. And they found, well, that's weird because these drugs are agonists, but they only bind certain subtypes of receptors. So that's just a sort of a theory kind of thing. Would right? you say that the botanical can be used for prostate enlargement? It's not necessarily working on the prostate, though. It's just increasing the urine flow. So you would have to use it with a prostate medication as well, right? Well, the, the complaint that most men have about the prostate is the urine flow. So if they have reduced urine flow, you need to increase urine flow, and you could just need to, you're not targeting the prostate, you're targeting the urethra. So you're making the sphincter looser, and you're making the, the walls of the bladder contract more hard so that the urine will flow more easily. You wouldn't end up with a blockage due to the prostate yeah. being enlarged? You're not really touching the prostate, though. No. You're, you're increasing urine, but it's not- No, you're not increasing urine, you're increasing urine flow. Mm -hmm. So you're increasing the mechanism rather than no, okay, so so when you're so I think in the book they go into this thing about the sympathetic versus the parasympathetic side. Here's the bladder, right? So here's the so here's your bladder, right? And then there's the urethra, right? And the sphincters and stuff that keep everything from flowing out. So when you give a sympathetic, let's see, if you give a Sympathetic blocker, an alpha-1 blocker, or a cholinergic agonist, what you're doing is you're making the walls contract more forcefully, and you're making this area open up as much as possible. Right? But so if far? The prostate is, is enlarged, right. wouldn't that clamp down on the urethra in a way that it wouldn't allow the urine to pass? If the prostate clamps down in a way so that the, the, the urine can't pass at all, that's a medical emergency. Okay. Because uh, the urine, if it can't pass at all, it, it backs up into the kidneys and kills your kidneys. So basically what you're usually dealing with is the prostate's pushing a little bit like this, right? And then you have your natural sphincter tone. I can't, is the sphincter up here or here? I can't remember. I'm an eye doctor. Do you guys remember? Uh, there's, let's put it here. <laughs> I don't think that's where it is. I think it's up here. There's two. There's two. All right, all right. So here's your sphincter, right? And you have a natural amount of sympathetic tone, right? For every organ, there's a little bit of sympathetic, there's a little bit of parasympathetic. So normally you have you know, a closed, uh, a sort of half more closed sphincter. Um, so if the prostate's pushing on the outflow and you have that sphincter tone, then what happens is you just have little drips coming out. So if you have the prostate pressing there and you can open up that sphincter as much as possible, then you'll have better urine flow. Does that make sense now? Blockage is still there, but you're just giving it a bigger Exit. Right, because you prefer not to have to drill into their prostate because it screws all sorts of stuff up if you accidentally hit all the nerves to the rest of the penis and things like that. Does that make sense? Well, the penis is down at this part, and then there's the prostate, and then your bowel and your bladder. Every time you go digging around anywhere, you can have complications. So you can, if you can, if you can delay having to grow to root out the prostate as long as possible by just giving a drug that makes the urine flow better, that's going to be good. Does that make sense? Right. So in that case, you're, pre you're, you're not treating the big prostate, you're treating the symptom. It's not a cure, it's just treating the symptom that the patient doesn't want. Make sense? Everyone's thinking about prostates now? <laughs> All right, the, I only asked you to learn one direct acting drug, and the one I picked was Bifanacol because it ends with call, which sounds like acetylcholine, so it helps you remember that it is the cholinergic agonist, and even the trade name has choline in it. You couldn't ask for a bigger hint, right? Um, in terms of an indirect acting drug, so we have an indirect acting reversible enzyme inhibitor, enzyme inhibitor, in particular, a drug that inhibits acetylcholinesterase. All right, now before I even go further, notice the drugs I'm asking you to memorize. Meostigmine, pranostigmine, Ravastigmine, physostigmine. What's the same about all these words? They all have a stigmine. So if you can just remember, stigmine is an indirect acting cholinergic agonist. It increases the level of acetylcholine. Then you, you're, that's fine. At this point in your career, that's all you need to worry about. All right? But you know, later on, you're going to need to know the difference between the two drugs. If you're going to learn one, I would learn physostigmine because that one is used as an antidote to uh, anticholinergic poisoning. So we'll talk about how that happens, how that works out. So if I have, 
When I was an ophthalmology resident, I had to go uh, catheterize one patient. And uh, the attending comes up to me and goes, I'm sorry, but you, you just had your internship. Can you catheterize this patient? And I said, no. I said, but I thought this was the whole point of being an eye doctor, so I wouldn't have to catheterize it. He's like, yeah, but I haven't done it in like 15 years. Can you do it? I'm like, oh, okay. So I had to do it. So I apologize. I, anything below the nose, I'm a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, rusty about it. Okay. So here we have the, uh, let's go back to this now. So here's a single coli, all right? Presynaptic terminal, it's released, and then it binds its receptor, all right? And does whatever it's gonna do. It reduces heart rate, makes it easier to urinate, whatever. Uh, when the acetylcholine is done doing its thing, it gets chewed up by acetylcholinesterase, which then breaks it down, all right? So if I inhibit these stigmine drugs, what they do is inhibit that enzyme. So if I inhibit the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine, what happens to the level of acetylcholine? It goes up. Now this, these drugs actually increase acetylcholine everywhere, which means you also have increased acetylcholine at muscles and nicotinic ganglia and all that stuff. But for now, let's just think about the muscarinic receptors, okay? So if you have a, uh, po there's poisons that are just acetylcholinesterase inhibitors that are indirect acting um, drugs that are also irreversible, um, then you really have a huge buildup of acetylcholine. All right, so what are the side effects gonna be of these drugs? Are they gonna be dry with big white pupils? And all dry, or are they going to be vomiting and small pupils and pooping and urinating? Too much acetylcholine. The exploding soldier. You'll have the soldier, everything comes out of the soldier. Right? So you'll have the sludge. Right? Sympathetic nervous system is the young pregnant woman in the forest. Uh, uh, acetylcholine, muscarinic receptors, is the poor soldiers staggering around in the field and vomiting. Does that make sense? All right, what if I have an overdose of this drug? I have the drug that blocks acetylcholinesterase. What if I have an overdose of it? What am I gonna do? What, how do I save the patient? They're staggering around, their heart rate is super low, blood pressure is really low, they <laughs> can't breathe because all their bronchial passages are closed off. They're dying from way, way too much acetylcholine, so what do you use? Or you just run away. You give them the atropine. You give them atropine. You give them an anticholinergic drug. All right? So I'm going to give atropine. Atropine will come in and block the receptor. Oh no, this, this pen is no more. This is an X pen. And block the effect. Now, here's a question why can't you just use epinephrine? Because epinephrine binds alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2, it has the same effect as atropine. Could you use epinephrine to treat those symptoms? Yeah. yeah, you could. But the reason you want to use atropine is that that's binding the sympathetic receptors, and the problem is being caused by overstimulation of the muscarinic receptors. So you want to target your treatment to the root cause, if possible. So atropine is definitely going to be the thing that you use. Does that make sense? All right, so now I get to lay on you the thing that confuses everybody, which is atropine is a anticholinergic, right? That's what it's called. It's called an anticholinergic. Cholinergic, all right? The acetylcholinesterase drug, the drug that inhibits that, is called an anticholinesterase. An example of an anticholinesterase is physostigmine, which is called antilirium. Okay? So I can say antilirium and anticholinesterase is the antidote to an overdose of anticholinergic. Do you see why that screws people up? Because every word has anti in it. You don't like know what anything does anymore. 
All right? So be very aware uh, when you're with patients and also on tests and quizzes. If you see an anti-cola something, make sure you read the end of the word because an anticholinergic is a parasympathetic blocker. An anticholinesterase is inhibiting this enzyme and is therefore a cholinergic drug because it acts like acetylcholine. So like make a star, draw an arrow, I think at the bottom of the page or maybe at the beginning of the page, somewhere, here it is on the next page, like make sure you have that straight in your head. ACE, things that end with ACE tend to be enzymes and pretty much in this class, every enzyme ends with ASE, except for those cytochrome P450 ones. They just couldn't be bothered to name them something reasonable. The people would recognize that they just had to give them weird number names. But ACE is enzyme. So an anticholinesterase is not an anticholinergic drug. An anticholinesterase is a cholinergic drug because it's increasing acetylcholine. Okay? Uh, okay. Let's see. Okay, so we've got about 12 minutes. We're in good shape here. Now, this, the poisons that they're uh, giving you, these poor soldiers, um, are like the nerve gas, the famous nerve gas is a sarin nerve gas, which was used in the uh, Tokyo attacks in, or, I don't know if it was all Tokyo, maybe it was just different areas in sort of, the, sort of like Tokyo one end, like Chicago one end. Um, and I don't remember when that was, is that 15 or 20 years ago? But there was this weird cult and they decided that uh, they would set off, they would release sarin gas in the subways and it just injured and killed all sorts of people. Um, and that was sarin gas, which is I think the same thing they're using on those soldiers in that video. Um, and also because we live in Illinois, uh, we have this huge rural community and a lot of the pesticides used by farmers are also called organophosphates and they are so also are uh, anticholinesterase drugs, but they're irreversibly active. So if you have a patient that comes in with nerve gas, uh, poisoning, or probably more likely you're going to see patients who are poisoned with um, the pesticides, you have to give them what? So these drugs are irreversibly acting anticholinesterases. So what is the fix for that? What's the antidote for that? Nope, that will kill the patient because the phytostigmine will actually make the acetylcholinesterase even less effective. Then you got to give atropine. Okay? Does that make sense? Now for these poisons, this is a poison thing, right? If you know which poison it is that is doing the problem, because a patient will come in, I've been poisoned with something and they, and they have all these symptoms and you're like, oh, you've obviously been poisoned by something that's either a cholinergic thing or some kind of weird broad spectrum anti-sympathetic thing. Um, but if you know which pesticide it is, you can actually give uh, another drug that will actually fix the damaged enzyme, um, and that will save them. So usually these organophosphates in sarin gas, the way that they destroy the acetylcholinesterase is to add a phosphate group covalently, it's a chemical bond. Um, so for those patients who get organophosphate poisoning, you also have to give them the, uh, a chemical that will release this phosphate group so that the acetylcholinesterase can work again. And that drug is called uh, pralidoxine or protocan. So, for cholinesterase, uh, anticholinesterase drugs, the treatment is atropine. For an anticholinesterase drug that's irreversibly acting, you have to give atropine plus some kind of oxine drug. You're not giving it your pralidoxine. So, pralidoxine doesn't bind any kind of sympathetic receptor, it's just like a chemical that gets that phosphate off when a patient's been poisoned. Okay? Nicotine, uh, the thing I want you to really know about nicotine is that it has definitely got a very high first pass effect, which is why you can't make nicotine brownies. They won't work. If you swallow that, uh, your, your liver will destroy all of it before it even gets to your bloodstream. So every, every way to get nicotine into your body is parenteral. So you could inject it, I don't think anyone does because that would, it's so much easier to just use a patch or a gum where it's being absorbed through your mouth or uh, smoking it or using a vaporizer or the e-cigarette poison devices. Uh, you could use any of those. Uh, you might think that nicotine would have no effect on you because it's gonna stimulate the sympathetic and the parasympathetic side at the same time. You might think well, there's no effect, but it turns out that the resting state for the sympathetic and parasympathetic sides, the resting state of the sympathetic side is kind of like 
keep your blood pressure higher. And the resting state of your parasympathetic side is to kind of keep your GI tract going, you know, so you're digesting. And so it's not a perfect balance in every organ. But the big thing is nicotine, first pass metabolism, uh, you have to use a patch or inhale. All right, and what's nice about this handout is by the time it gets to the anticholinergics, you totally know what these do. Anticholinergics do everything you would expect from an alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2 blocker because they kind of, uh, an, an antagonist, an anticholinergic drug, I'm sorry, an anticholinergic drug does anything you'd expect from a combination of a alpha-1, beta-1, beta-2 agonist. Right, so sort of like what epinephrine does is what acetylcholine does, sort of the same thing. All right, uh, the only difference is that in terms of the brain, not the autonomic nervous system, in terms of the brain, when you get Sudafed, phenylephrine, cocaine, amphetamine, any of these kind of sympathetic things, alpha-1 sympathetic things, they'll tend to wake patients up. Sudafed used to be, I mean, I used to use Sudafed all the time for my allergies, and it kept me awake. It was great. Um, but uh, anticholinergics, when they get into the brain, they actually make you drowsy. So that's like the only thing that's really different about the anticholinergics and the sympathetic drugs. Atropine is used for everything. If you have, a, if you have an overdose of physostigmine, you can use atropine. If you had an overdose of atropine, you would use physostigmine. Um, I've given you a bunch of drugs to uh, know, uh, but hopefully, and that's because these drugs will all appear again in future units. But hopefully you'll notice atropine, atropine, T-R-O-P, uh, ipratropium, benztropine, um, oxybutynin isn't any good, but ditropine, the trade name helps you. Um, and then scopolamine, for some reason the O-P and scopolamine helps me remember that that is a anticholinergic drug. So even if you can't remember, oh, that, uh, you know, benztropine tends to be a Parkinson's drug, ipratropine tends to be a lung drug, even if you can't remember that on a test, you, probably, you should be able to at least remember what drug class it is and kind of be able to figure it out. That makes sense. You guys are troopers, totally hanging in there. I just want to point out this, uh, where is it? Here it is. All right. This is uh, from the review that I asked you to do. Again, the first three pages were sort of basically what the quiz was about. Uh, and I just want to go through a couple of these questions, four, five, and six, and then you can escape and go have breakfast or something. Uh, okay, so on every test in this class, I will have a section, which is, you know, if you're in the hospital, you're in the emergency room, usually it's the zombie apocalypse or something, so there's nobody to help you. And patients come in with various problems, and they give you a couple drugs, and like, which drug do you give the patient? Okay, all right, so here's a 31-year-old, who fell into a vat of organophosphate poisoning, uh, a pesticide, uh, is brought into the emergency room. What will the symptoms be? What will Jessica's symptoms be? Fell into a vat of basically nerve gas, but it's pesticide. Well, she, right, she'll be a big puddle of sludge, right? Um, and what are the best drugs to administer? Atropine. Atropine. And then because it's a poison, you give that pralidoxy for a man. Here's one is a, a person who took an overdose of atropine. This happens actually a lot with kids because atropine is a commonly used eye drop for dogs and for uh, veterinary issues. Um, and so uh, I used to see people come in with uh, their kid poison. Also, another one I used to see in the emergency room was people would come and say, oh, I think I'm having a, a, um, an aneurysm because one of my pupils is dilated. And it would turn out that either they touched their dog's atropine eye drops or they had one of these scopolamine patches and put it on and forgot to wash their hands. So they like put the patch on and then rubbed their eye and then the pupil dilates. So, um, all right, so here's somebody who took an overdose of atropine. So what are her symptoms? Hmm? Right, all the sympathetic things. Nothing's really coming out, but the heart rate's high, the blood pressure's high, pupils are big, all right? Um, and so, uh, what's the best drug you can give? So, too much atropine, too much anticholinergic? Yeah, so then you give too much acetylcholine, so you give phytostigmine or anti -lary. Does that make sense? Uh, here's somebody who was getting her IV dose of Levofed, soon be dead, and the line infiltrated and leaks into the flush of the arm. Uh, what drug are you going to inject? 
to fix the problem of petition necrosis, to keep it from happening. So levothyroxine binds alpha-1 and beta-1, but in the arm, the beta-1 part doesn't really count. So the alpha-1 causes that vasoconstriction. So what do you give to counteract it? It's the antidote for alpha-1 agonist. I know, it's like, I, it's, it's hard to think of the last few days of it. You, an antidote for an alpha-1 agonist will be an alpha-1 alpha -1 blocker. So usually the one that's used is one called phentolamine. You could probably use one of the zosins if it was, you know, if you had nothing else. I was reading an article in the New York Times saying that now there's going to be tons of drug shortages. So you may end up having to do stuff like this, like, oh, we don't have this drug, what can we use instead? You work in a nursing home. There's no doctor. You're, it's you. There's, you're not in charge. You're in charge. Here's a guy with hypertension. What are drugs that lower his blood pressure? Okay, so what are ways that your body can lower blood pressure? And I don't, and there's that whole renin angiotensin aldosterone thing, which I'm not going to worry about for this test. But what are other ways that your body can lower blood pressure? Or you can lower blood pressure with, with drugs. Relax the blood vessels. You can dilate blood vessels or what else? My interpretive dance. Yes, you can lower heart rate. So to lower heart rate, you can give a beta blocker. To dilate blood vessels, you could give an alpha-1 blocker or even a beta-2 agonist to dilate those. You could give an a anticholinergic, which will dilate blood vessels and will, will um, I'm sorry, if I want to lower heart rate, I would give a cholinergic drug, hello, um, that will lower heart rate and dilate blood vessels. So those are all different classes of drugs you could do to lower blood pressure. Okay. Uh, and then this one, let me just do one of these for you and then you'll know how it works. So let's do uh, this one, the lady who hasn't peed, right? So she's, she's, her, your, she's, she doesn't have incontinence, she doesn't have you know, any uresis, she's not bedwetting. The problem is she can't pee. So how do you make someone, make it easier to pee? So you can give a cholinergic drug to help urine come out easier, like bethanicol. Or you could give an alpha-1 blocker, like prazosin. So what you'd say here is the drug class is possible would be uh, bethanicol, the neurotransmitter receptor would be uh, acetylcholine and muscarinic. An example would be bethanicol. Or you could say, well, you could use an alpha-1 blocker, which would be blocking an alpha-1 adrenergic receptor, and you could use terazosin or something. And actually, the answer for this one with the big prostate is the same, same two classes of drugs. An asthma attack, you could use either a beta-2 agonist or an anticholinergic. Either one will make the breathing passages more dilated. See how that works. All right, I've already posted for you guys a uh, what to do for the exam. So basically, when you're when you're like trying to get all ready for the exam, the thing to do is print out those three sheets. What to do for week two, week three, and week four. Do all that stuff. Okay, um, review your quiz. I'll post the quiz uh, with answers uh, no later than noon today. Um, and make sure that you go through that. Make sure the practice problems. Bold face stuff, make sure you know bold face stuff. Next time we'll have, you'll come in, you'll take the test, and then we won't have anything afterwards. I'll have you watch some videos instead of sitting here. Uh, I find that if I try to lecture after the test, everyone, nobody's, nobody cares. <laughs> I just want to clarify, like yes. on, the, so on the quiz that pages you have a uh, cholinergic blocker, that is an anti-cholinergic right? right. Okay. By the way, somebody sure. called me yesterday and told me, uh, she said, well, I don't understand this one uh, uh, flashcard set has this mistake in it. And I'm like, which one? And it turned out, I had some flashcard sets called In Progress. I hadn't even like worked on those. I had imported them from a student and hadn't checked it, so I just removed them because you guys weren't supposed to be able to see those. Uh, so hopefully the ones that are up now are all correct. Um, so I promise you. All right. Uh, if you're supposed to talk to me after class, just hang on for a second. Yes. Ma 